much, Mr. Arif Zaman. I really uh, I enjoyed your presentation, as did the, uh, the rest of the audience, and your comment that reputation is an asset that needs to be managed. After all, in business, we're all managing and looking after assets, yet reputation often gets overlooked, which has been the focus of your presentation. And he did say that reputation is more important than just public relations, and it's all about managing customer expectations. But I also appreciated the fact that he highlighted the significance and the importance of a reputation management in our Pakistani context. So thank you very much for being here and making the trip all the way from the United Kingdom. Now, before I introduce our next speaker, and again, we're going to be uh, bringing an international flavor to this conference, which is very, very exciting part of uh, CNBC's initiative in this area. I'm going to remind you that after our next presentation, we're going to take questions from, the, uh, from you people. If you'd like to ask questions to any of our panelists, uh, what we would request is if you would just write the questions and uh, you can send them up to the front and the questions will be answered, okay? So just write a little note and if you want to address the question to a specific uh, person, then please just mention who you'd like that question uh, addressed to. Okay, so we'd like to have some interaction after our next presentation. Now, keeping this international flavor going, I'm very happy to say that our next uh, presentation is coming all the way from London. Stilpon Nestor, he's the managing director of Nestor Advisors. This is a firm that specializes in corporate governance. Their clients include some of the leading companies around the world. He himself is a Harvard Law graduate, and he's regarded as uh, an international expert in the area of corporate governance. Now, we would like to have brought him to Pakistan, but of course he loves the we weather in London so much that he didn't want to leave. I'm just kidding. Apparently, they've not had a summer in London. Would that be right? No summer. So despite the attraction of the weather and every, all the hospitality of Pakistan, he's uh, agreed to join us all the way from London. And he's on the line now, so let's go and talk to him. Good morning. Um, I would like, first of all, start to start by thanking the organizers for having me here with you in this uh, high-level meeting, even if it's from a studio in London, thousands of miles away. Uh, my only regret is that I won't be there with you to uh, participate in the discussion, which I'm sure is going to be fascinating, uh, given the level and the experience of the participants in this conference. I'm the managing director of Nestor Advisors, which is a corporate governance advisory firm based in London, and which counts among its clients a number of financial institutions in Europe and emerging markets. Some of the points I will raise with you today are based on a Nestor Advisor study of the role and functioning of bank boards uh, in the 25 largest European banks. Uh, and on some observations as to how these findings uh, relate to performance of some of these banks since the crisis started. We are happy to share uh, this study with any of you and please do not hesitate to contact us if you uh, want to have a look at it. I once asked a non-executive member of a board of a very, very large Swiss bank and herself a former corporate banker and a member of this bank's risk committee to summarize the most important objective of the board as the top governance instance of a bank. Her response? Managing reputational risk. I have to say that at that time, which is a few years back, I was not totally convinced. Wasn't the board there to direct and control the bank as per the UK combined code? Yes, she said. But direction and control run all the way from the top to the bottom of the organization. The board really should concern itself in a hands-on way with only those aspects of direction and control that have a direct impact on the reputation of the firm. I believe that she was absolutely right. So, what is this reputational risk that I was asked to speak about today? In my view, reputational risk is the likelihood of significant secondary fallout from occurrences and events that are also of primary significance as credit, market liquid or liquidity, or operational risk events. In other words, we are concerned with the reflection of an event on the various stakeholders 
that surround a financial institution. This reflection has a direct bearing on the amount of trust these shareholders, stakeholders and shareholders, of course, are willing to put on that institution. Losses related to the secondary fallout might be extremely significant. And they are asymmetric in nature. In other words, reputation and trust take years to build, but a few minutes to lose. Because of its secondary asymmetric character, reputational risk is difficult to quantify and model ex ante. That is why it is not included in the Basel framework of banking supervision or capital adequacy, and banks do not have to hold capital against it. It is also because of its unpredictability, its asymmetric character and its potential for generating enormous swings in shareholder value, that reputational risk should be less the domain of specialist managers, as are other risks, and more the stuff that board leadership needs to tackle. Oversight role and by actively shaping policy in the management of the risk. Of course, every institution bears a secondary reputational risk. A teller eating a sandwich at a branch has an impact on reputation. The operational risk, in other words, the direct loss related to people, systems and processes as defined by the Basel Committee, related to this behavior of the teller eating a sandwich is minimal and it's not really worth the time of the calculation. But the image of the full mouth teller might very well drive the customer away. And if there's a journalist lurking around, it might create an image of the bank in the press that is hard to change. But let me maybe give you another example on a grander scale. Many of you had read the travails of UBS, one of the world's most sophisticated financial institutions. UBS has three main business lines. Wealth management, which is its core management, its core business, asset management, and investment banking, which was developed mostly during the last 10 or 15 years. As a result of the recent crisis, UBS had to write off 43 billion worth of assets in its balance sheet. This was the result of a straightforward market and liquidity, or mostly, uh, risk which materialized under current crisis conditions. But in addition to these write-downs, UBS also saw a net outflow of 16 billion from its wealth management business, an amount that is, according to analysts, much higher than that warranted by the demand contraction in these services. It is, I think, fair to say that a large part of this amount consists of the reputational fallout, especially on most conservative Swiss wealth clients, resulting from the dent in the cast iron reputation of the bank for effective risk management. This failure has also changed the mood of the Swiss banking regulators, which might result in significantly higher future compliance costs for UBS and a significantly less accommodating stance on the, by the regulator versus the bank. What are the key sources of reputational risk? Some, I would say, general for all businesses. And some others are quite specific to sectors. For example, in extractive industries, health, safety and the environment are the foremost reputational risks. But these are not the foremost reputational risks in banking. One key reputational risk for all listed companies relates to the credibility of its accounts and their reporting. This is what I would call the Enron risk. Again, the primary risk here is legal and regulatory, but the reputational fallout in terms of loss of confidence might be immensely more significant than the fines related to a restatement. Audit committees are tasked to oversee closely the management of this annual risk. 
Executive succession is another key risk for all listed companies, which has the potential for significant reputational fallout. A bank might continue humming along from an operational perspective without strong executive leadership for a surprising amount of time, although not forever. But the impact of lack of leadership on, on trust among various stakeholders could be devastating, far outstripping the real losses from the operations. In banks, it is the people risk that is much more significant than many other sectors. This is, after all, a people business. If there are too many tellers eating while working, the whole franchise might be hurt. And this is even truer if the bank fails over time to attract and retain top talent of the highest ethical standards. That is why many US and European banks broaden the mandate of the remuneration committee to encompass strategic human resource direction. The quality of the people extends of course to the board itself. Board nomination committees are in effect charged with raising reputational capital so that the board of the bank can in its turn manage reputational risk. Regulatory fit and proper requirements are not enough. In this respect, boards struggle to find senior non-executive directors or chairmen with adequate banking expertise who do not face a conflict of interest. The growing complexity and geographical diversity of underlying banking businesses combined with the scarcity of available talent puts a very high premium on continuity between executive and board leadership. This might explain why the most why excuse me why most of the least stricken banks in our study in other words the better performing ones in better of their share price performance and their level of write downs over this last uh, crisis period these banks have broken with conventional corporate governance wisdom and made their former CEOs chairman of their boards. This might also explain why the banks with the worst performing share prices in Europe tend to have the youngest boards in terms of average tenure of their non-executive directors. Last but not least, it should be clear from the UBS example that the key reputational risk for a bank is the way it manages its front-line credit, market, liquidity and operational risk. That is why the quality of the risk philosophy of setting risk appetite, of the risk management system, of risk governance, the way decisions are made when, as risk is managed, and of the people that make them must be a key concern for a bank board. In some of the most stricken banks in our comparative European banking study, the least performing ones, boards never created the systems needed to properly set risk appetite and oversee risk management. Within our 25 strong peer group, the majority of the banks which have suffered the worst share price declines have been those which fail to establish a board level risk committee. Conversely, among the best performers, um, the risk committees have been set up during the last five years, so the risk responsibility has migrated from senior management to actually board level. The amount of time spent by the whole board on risk related issues has increased by more than 30% over the last three years in most of our best performing banks. And in fact, two of the best European performers, Spanish banks Santander and BBVA, board risk committees composed in majority by non-executive directors meet as often or even more often than audit committees and are paying even more. This is maybe an indication of changing priorities in banking boards. However, 56% of peer banks still require their audit committee 
already overburdened by managing and run risks, to oversee all of risk management. The lack of board level understanding of risk in most of the peers was sometimes compounded by the fact that risk management itself, the function, often did not report or have direct access to top management on the board. Having the head of the Royal Bank of Scotland's risk function reports to the CFO without access to the group executive committee or to the main board might have provided the board and top management with less insight on the vulnerabilities of the balance sheet, which eventually materialized. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like once again to underline the importance of reputational risk as a compass for the board's attention. How do we safeguard and improve our reputation is probably the first question that the board should ask in setting its priorities. With this, I would like to thank you very much and wish you all the best of luck with the rest of your proceedings. Thank you. I'm sure you would agree that it's really good to get another perspective from someone all the way. In this case, not the only person from United Kingdom, but it was really good to get an international flavor to our conference here this uh, morning.